nothing will stop me from laughing obnoxiously. Oh, and she, you can see the little ears. Like, I wonder what will happen. <laughs> it was good. It was really good. Okay. Hey, Faye, you gonna sit on my lap? Or mommy's lap. Start posting and all of that. So we're gonna scoot down a little bit. So is that awkward last 30 seconds? Like, what do we do now? Yeah, like right now, like it's real quiet. Nobody knows. Like, why are they so quiet? Elston <laughs> Family Church morning, is not Kim. known for quiet. Period. At all. Oh, it's live. Really? Oh, all right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started because yes. people are still probably finding us on Facebook. Good morning, Elston Family Church in the house. Good Good morning, Elston Family Church on Facebook Live. It is great to be here on kind of a toasty morning. It's mm -hmm. been freezing cold until yesterday, and now it's a whole different thing. So, just working through a few technical issues, and we are good. God's in the house this morning. So I just want to take a minute and welcome um, each and every one of you for joining us this morning. Um, you know, it's a, a whole different way to sort of do church in these days. And so um, with your questions, any of that, please touch base with us and um, pray. For us. To announce right away. Oh, yes. So, Elston Family Church on Facebook. There's also Celebrate Recovery, Elston Family Church on Facebook. Those are some places you can check out for information of what's going on here. Um, the Deep is meeting now here at church. Um, so, students, parents, um, if you need to connect with Reagan, please do so. Um, 6 to 8, like normal, or 6 to 7.30. Um, so, please join us on Wednesdays. I know the prayer team is starting to come back together. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about prayer this morning. And so if you have prayer requests this morning, feel free to comment those. Um, say good morning. Let us know where you're um, watching this from. And um, we'll kind of go from there. So I'm going to hand this off to Pastor Andy. All right, here we go. Let's stand up this morning, those of you who are in the building, and let's worship. This morning, uh, we don't always tie themes together, but sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, in terms of really strong current of worship tying into the, to the, to the part of preaching and teaching. But one of the things that I love to do in our worship is I like to talk about God's goodness. I like to talk about how good he is and what he's done and who he is and what all he's able to do. And so just want to encourage you that encourage you this morning in that that that's just kind of where we're going to be that he he's he's all things. He's good, he's faithful, he's true. He's the way maker, he's the miracle worker. He turns graves into gardens. He's our healer. And so let's just celebrate that this morning. Amen? Amen. When I'm in the roughest waters, I won't go under, I won't drown. And when I'm in over my head I know that you won't let me drown when I'm broken and down to nothing I know that you are always up to something good Something good. Even through the deepest valleys, you go before me, you are here. For I know you'll never leave me, your love surrounds me, I won't fear. When I'm broken, down to nothing. I know that you are always up to something good. I know that you are always up to something good. You'll make a way, whatever it takes. There's nothing your love won't. 
won't endure I know that you are always up to something good Through the darkest night you are on my side You are always faithful Through my fear and doubt you will lead me out you are always able through the darkest night you are on my side you are always faithful through my fear and doubt you will lead me out you are always able you're faithful i know that you are always up to something good I know that you are always up to something good you'll make a way you'll make a way whatever it takes there's nothing your love won't endure I know that you are always up to something good you'll make a way you'll make a way Whatever it takes, there's nothing your love won't endure. I know that you are always up to something good. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's Nothing is better than you. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. You came along, put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better. Than Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all. You still call me friend. He's the God of the mountains. Is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace will find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. There's no 
nothing, oh, there's nothing better than you, oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. Shame into glory. You're the only one who can. Let's turn morning into dancing again. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who The New Testament writer James asks and encourages, are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? Come together and pray to the God who loves us. Pray to the God who created us, who created us for community, whether that's over the phone or through text. We still want to hear from one another, even if we're not in person. So be encouraged today. Our God is big. He is faithful. And he is a healer. I believe you're my healer. I believe you.
more than enough. Because you're the way maker and the miracle worker, the promise keeper and the light in the darkness. Turn ashes into bodies. Turn our mourning into dancing. You turn graves into gardens. You're the great I am, the God who can. The miracle worker of all things. Father, as we have been spending time just talking about your goodness and how you're always up to something good, even when we can't see it and feel it. How you do all these things just because of who you are. So we don't worship you and praise you because of what we get from you. We just worship you and praise you because of who you are. Not a result of your goodness and your faithfulness to your people and those that you love and care for. You do good things. So this morning we just want to put an exclamation point on the fact that you are a healer of emotions and spiritual walk and everything that we need. You're, it's all found in you. We thank you and we praise you. Now feed us, Lord, from your word. Give us encouragement and hope and strength. And talk to us. And let us know, Father, how we can, as a result of hearing your word, be doers. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you in the building, you can be seated. Those of you at home, I'm assuming we made connection. You can be seated too, or you can stand up, or whatever you want to do, I guess. So good morning, Elson Family Church, part two. Whoa. Good morning, Elson Family Church, part two. Good morning. Jeez, all the 50 and over rocked the house. You guys are sitting here like, yee, 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 yee. All right, well, it's good to see you. It's good to have another day where we can gather, gather together and um, kind of be in a live setting. Uh, this is Memorial Weekend. Memorial Day is tomorrow. Uh, and all of you know what Memorial Day is all about. Uh, it's a holiday observed on the last Monday of May, honoring men and women who have died while serving in the military. And I just want to pause and just take a moment to um, just reflect on that, to just pray and pray for those whose families have been impacted by the loss of those who served in military. And uh, some of you, even in this house, have served. And I, I mean, again, I can't express enough my gratitude and gratefulness for the freedom that we walk in because of your service. And uh, freedom comes with a price. It always comes with shed blood, unfortunately. But Jesus showed that on the cross, that for us to have true freedom, blood had to be spilled out. So I just want to pray for those families and just pray for this time uh, and just encourage those um, who have uh, families who have been impacted by loss in this time in this season. Father, we just we thank you for Memorial Day. We thank you for the Memorial Weekend event and 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 just that that holiday that we just take some time and we gather as families and we do we do lots of things that are fun and and cookouts and all that kind of stuff. But God, we we wouldn't be able to do a lot of stuff if it wasn't for those who've served faithfully through the years and who gave their lives and shed blood all across the world on various soils so that we could be free today. Sometimes we take our freedom for granted. Forgive us for that. But today we thank you and we bless those families who've been impacted by loss through the years. Pray your special blessing on maybe widows and maybe those who've lost a mom or dad or an uncle or a son in times past. As we, again, part into your word, Lord, bring light to the darkness and show us the way that you want us to go. And we pray this in your name. Amen. So we're going to finish up uh, the book of James this morning. We're in chapter 5, and so I think uh, we're going to have maybe it on the back screen. Uh, and if you have a Bible app and it requires Wi-Fi, so sorry uh, if you can't pull it up because we've got to have the Wi-Fi dedicated. But I think we have it on the back here. Those of you at home uh, who are watching 
Maybe you can tune into your phone or tablet or your hard copy, copy as well. We're in chapter 5. We're going to start um, in verse 1. And so James, what he's done, I mean, it sounds kind of bold and that we're going to go through this chapter 5 really quickly. But what's happening is James has done what most, I would say, probably good speakers would do. And that is that you tell them what you're going to say, and then you say it, and then you tell them again what you've said. That's kind of that recycling of information. And so I don't know if James did this all in one setting, all, all five chapters that we now read. Uh, but certainly there's this reoccurring of themes that come throughout. And so he's coming back, and he's doing some punch list things, so to speak. And so right here, right off the bat, a warning to the rich. Look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of the terrible troubles ahead of you. Great intro message line, right? You know, got the crowd all enjoying everything that they're hearing. Uh, James has never minced words in this book, and he's not starting today. And again, a lot of this is just about a lot of warnings and a lot of exhortation for the first generation of Christians whom he's speaking to. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth that you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. Ouch. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you've cheated on their day for pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of the heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves on the day for, uh, for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. And we're not far from that even in our day. Patience and endurance. Verse 7. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job. A man of great endurance. You see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be condemned. We walk through verses 13 and the following. And he just refers to, in verse 17, Elijah was as human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky went down. Uh, sky, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. For the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone is among you, wanders away from the truth, and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. So James is talking to the church, and James starts out with yet another severe tongue lashing. And he's focused in on the rich and those with material and financial means. Now, we already hit this in chapter 2. You may remember back in chapter 2 where he was talking about people who are walking in the church. And we show this prejudice and favor towards those who look like they have it all together, who are among the rich and the well-to-do. And so we tend to give them an extra special place versus those that maybe just doesn't look like they got it all together. And this is a strong rebuke in chapter 2. You know, these people used to go out and actually rent rings and jewelry and put them on their fingers, and they would just kind of float around like they really had something together. And so James is simply saying, we tend to favor those who have it all together, and that is something that the Lord in the Bible and the Word condemns. And so he hits this again pretty strongly and it's not an issue of money. It's an issue of heart position. The Bible does not condemn those with money or an abundance of material possessions. The Bible just simply warns us and others that what money can do to us. It is a root of all evil. And it can produce a life of tremendous selfishness. The heart is really the issue. 
You see, everything that we have is a gift from God. If you don't recognize and know that and you don't proclaim that, then I'm, I'm going to encourage you this morning to kind of get that set straight in your heart. Everything that you have is from God. What you're wearing on your body right now, the vehicle you drove up, and the, the, the house that you're sitting in, the TV you're watching, everything is a gift from God. It's all from Him. Our possessions, everything that we call our own. But the real ultimate heart test is what do we do with what we've been given? And that would even include our spiritual gifts. So as much spiritually as God has put into us and endowed us with in terms of our faith in Christ and all the material things and the blessings he's given us physically, everything comes from God. What are we doing with it? So here's a couple of questions to ponder. This is kind of the thing that James was trying to drive home when he started this out so, so harsh against the rich and those with financial means. Do you spend all of this on yourself? So think about a couple of questions here. Think, just ponder on these things. And, and, and we don't think of ourselves as rich. We'd kind of like to think that we're not so rich, maybe in this room and those of you at home. But again, in America, we are the richest among the world. So what do you do with your possessions? Do you spend it all on yourself? Or do you use it for the benefit of others? The hard check is this. Why do we keep collecting and acquiring all of this stuff, yet ignoring those in need? That is what was going on then, and that is what is ultimately at some level going on now. Why do we keep acquiring and getting and all this stuff? And it's going to burn anyway. And he's saying this is a corruption of the soul now. For the appetite of the more, the appetite for more things all the time is actually a cancer and a corruption of your soul. So James gives this strong warning. He says... That really irritates God. That, that upsets him. And he's going to turn the tables in his coming kingdom just like he did 2,000 years ago in the temple. To spend everything on ourselves and ignore the needs of others is self-indulgent living and it doesn't please God. So then he moves to patience and endurance. And again, we saw this in chapter 1 where he was talking about enduring trials. Remember he was talking about the perseverance, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials and persevere through it. So um, how many of you, maybe even those of you at home, you can comment, how many of you have ever prayed for patience? God, give me patience with this person. Give me patience with my friend at school. Give me patience with my spouse. Give me patience. Can I tell you that's the dumbest thing you can ever do? Mm -hmm. Really, don't even do it. One of the things I know about patience is none of us like it, so why would we ask for something we don't like? I mean, that's almost like asking for, for cooked spinach for dinner. Oh, I'd like some with vinegar and nastiness. Yes, please. Why do we pray for patience? I think part of it is just kind of a root of we just recognize that we ultimately kind of need that in our lives because even now in our culture, everything is moving at lightning pace speed. I mean, we got all kinds of this and that and, and this Internet speed and that Internet speed, and we can talk across the world and we can globally connect across the world, and everything is microwave two seconds and it's here. But yet that has ultimately kind of spoiled us and ruined our real grasp of understanding of what patience can and will do for us. Because you see, patience is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And he gives the example of the farmer who plants every year and patiently waits for his crops to grow. He patiently waits for the harvest. This is an example is awesome because he simply, the farmer, cannot control the, the variables. He can't control the weather. We just finished planting garden yesterday. You, we, we just put it in the ground, and we have to wait and see what happens. And, and yeah, we can water it and help during the dry seasons, but most farmers can't do that. So they're going to patiently wait for the rains in the fall and the spring, to, to, and then they just wait for the crop. I mean, what an amazing example of just step back and let God do it. You see, if you and I are sitting in line at McDonald's for a happy meal and we're waiting 10 minutes extra than we thought we should have, we think that's patience and that we're being tested in our patience. That's not patience at all. You're being tested in your self-control and keeping your mouth closed and being kind and gentle when you get to the window and pay your bill. That's what you're being tested in. Because James simply adds this little twist to the real test to your test of patience is suffering. And you waiting an extra five or ten minutes in line at Chick-fil-A or McDonald's or wherever, that's not a test of your patience at all. Because you're really not suffering. 
unless you have five or six kids in your minivan, then maybe you are suffering. <laughs> During the last few months, I would say, and we're being tested in our patience, wouldn't you? Last couple months has really tested us, and it's, there's been a lot of just real stretch of patience. And during this period, I'm going to be honest with you, maybe some of us in this room, maybe even some of you at home, this, does, this hasn't impacted you. Maybe it's just been more of an inconvenience. But there's really been some people who have suffered severely in this season. They've suffered financially. They've suffered in terms of loneliness and depression and anxiety and sickness and ultimately some death. I mean, there have been some people, and maybe you are connected to it, and maybe you are even experiencing it, that have really, really suffered for many of us, it really has been just more of an inconvenience. But there are people who have truly suffered intense suffering. And during this time, I don't know about you, but it kind of feels like God's almost kind of been strangely quiet. That as we've walked through this season of just this weirdness and this anxiety and this heaviness and this just like almost God's... He's there, but he's not there, and he's listening, but he's not listening. It just feels almost as if he's just quiet. And James gives us an instruction, and I want to encourage you in this moment if you have felt like, where is God in all this? He mentions the prophets, and he specifically talks about a guy named Job. You've heard of Job? Have you read his book? Probably should. It's about 40 chapters. It is a lengthy book, but it's a good book. Job. Haven't you heard the expression, he's got the patience of Job? She's got the patience of Job. Where do you think they got that expression? Because Job developed his patience through suffering. He suffered severely. He lost everything. Some of us can maybe relate to that in this season. Some people have literally lost everything. They've lost finances. They've lost life. They've lost health. They've lost... But he got through it. He got through the suffering. And as a result, he had amazing levels of patience. He developed patience because he endured through the suffering. You say, I don't want to suffer. Well, then likely you're not going to learn patience. I don't want to be uncomfortable. Then likely you're not going to learn patience. I want it now, but well, then likely you're never going to have that fruit develop properly in your life through the Holy Spirit. So as I said, James is talking to these first generation Christians. And so what was happening here is that Jesus had, had recently ascended to heaven. And so they were just assuming that, that he's coming back like next week. He'll be back. He'll be back. He left, but he's coming back. And then weeks went into months and months went into years. And life was getting more difficult because persecution was ramping up against Christians and believers and Christ followers. And, and, and they weren't just sitting around eating bonbons. I mean, they were suffering. And so James simply said to them, look to Jesus for his imminent return, whether it be today or next week. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. And I want to tell you, church, that's probably the best encouragement I can give you this morning. In the midst of your hardships, in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of difficulties, keep your eyes on Jesus and his imminent return. For he's the author and the finisher of our faith. So as I wrestle and you wrestle through our suffering or the suffering of someone else that we know, here's some things I gleaned from a study on James through Francis Chan. He said first, just make sure your suffering and our suffering doesn't divide us. In other words, people process differently is what he's ultimately saying. He's saying don't grumble against one another. Don't judge one another. We heard that already last week. We've got to be careful about that in terms of not understanding what's going on in someone else's life. So don't let it divide us. Don't grumble. Number two, we can trust that being patient and persevering and writing it through to the end will result in our being blessed. Chapter 1, verse 12, James said, God blesses those who patiently endure testing. Number three, we can look to others who've suffered and persevered in the past. If they can do it, so can we. That's why he talked about the prophets. That's why he talked about Job. And we've seen others who've gone before us. And when we see the example of someone getting through and, and ultimately getting through to the other side, it's an encouragement. Amen? Amen? Because of Job, number four, we have good reason to know that when we verbalize our pain and our hurt and our suffering, even though we don't understand it, we get it out because 
Job kind of went on a rant with God. I don't know if you know that. If you read the book, you know that he kind of mouthed it out. And you're like, God, where are you? And his wife even really, like, you need to curse God and, you know. And so what we can learn from that is it's really okay to hand God a whole bunch of guff because it's not that you want to just do it to be defiant, but you're just simply saying, God, I don't understand this. It's okay to verbalize your pain and your hurt and your misunderstanding and your confusion about your suffering. We see it in the life of Job. He can handle Job's rant. He can handle yours. And then finally, through suffering, we can see that God is full of compassion and mercy. We have that confidence that he's not going to leave us, he's not going to forsake us, and he's going to see us through to the end because the story of Job tells us that. So this next section, we would go into that part of prayer where we did earlier during the song, and I want to just grab that, that, that thought here and tie it to the last phrasing of restoring wandering believers. And I want to just talk about prayer real quickly before we just talk about the idea of restoring those who've wandered away from the faith. You see, God has commanded us to pray. He, did, he didn't say, hey, it'd be a good idea. I'd like for you to pray. I mean, it might be kind of fun. But he said in his word, he's commanded us to pray numerous times. Our prayer is a connection to him. He doesn't need us to pray, but it's a connection to him. It's an avenue to him who is the resource of all things. Everything that he has for us, including our own spiritual growth and maturity, is found through prayer. If we're going to grow and mature, prayer has to be part of that. But here's the hard truth, and I want you to listen very carefully. If you don't hear anything else this morning, hear this. How much we pray is directly tied to how much we need God. Let me say that again. I think that bypassed a few of us. How much we pray is directly related to how much we need God. That sounds harsh. That's not original with me. I found it. It really worked. It's a good thought. It's a good word. It's a good truth. But it's true. Because the opposite of that, our lack of prayer shows our lack of dependence on Him. I can see this in my own life throughout my years of, of, of just growing and that when I am really, really consistent and really intentional about praying and seeking God, I just sense and feel my dependence just gravitating towards Him so intently. It's like I can't go without Him. I can't go another minute if I don't talk to Him. I can't go another day if I don't connect with Him. But I can also see that other side where I've been in a life of kind of leaning into what I know and, oh, well, I don't have time to pray today and I'm all good. And then all of a sudden, my life is being shipwrecked and it's because I have not been dependent upon Him. And when I don't walk in a time and place of prayer and connection, it shows up. That's why James said to us, so humble yourselves before God and resist the devil. He'll flee, come close to God, and he'll come close to you. And I think a lot of times our lack of praying is just not walking in humility and submitting before the Almighty God. We just think we got this. You see, the devil never wants you to pray. You could care less if you ever utter your first words off your lips. But God longs for it. And again, it's not because he needs it. He longs for it desires it. It's, it's relational. James is telling these first generation Christians and he's telling us as well to get through the hardships, to get through these difficult places, to get through your suffering, to, to, to walk through and develop the spirit and the fruit of patience as you suffer along. Pray, pray, and pray some more. Prayer is the avenue to find God's grace for forgiveness of your sins. Don't ever forget that. Prayer is the, is the avenue for your salvation to come to your heart. Through prayers of faith, people are delivered and set free from bondage and sin. Through the power of prayer, lives are changed. And when the community of believers of faith come together in Jesus' name and pray, amazing and powerful and awesome things happen. Because again, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces great results. Not a perfect person, but a person who has come rightly related to the Father through Jesus Christ. One of the things that's really challenging right now is, again, in this era and time that we're living with social distancing and lack of connection and lack of physical contact, 
on a typical Sunday morning like this, I might have had our church come together, have our elders come up, our leaders come up, and we would pray for you and anoint you with oil and just, just say, what's your need and what's the hardship? And do you need physical healing? Do you need emotional healing? And, and, and it, again, this is not about, about believing that somehow we have some special power. It's just scripture. The scripture teaches, as James says, do this. And, and prayers are answered through faith in God who can. And whether it happens in the moment or not, whether it happens when they get to heaven, praying in faith for healing physically, emotionally, and spiritually is something we should do. And so I wouldn't have a hesitation on a typical morning to come together, and if you want me to pray for you, I'll lay hands on you and pray for you, and our elders the same. Right now in this weirdness, we're not doing that, although I'm not saying I wouldn't not do it. We're just not doing it right now. You want me to put gloves on and mask it up and put oil on? I'll do it. I'm not afraid of touching you just because of what we're facing. But what I'm saying is this. Through the technology we have, use it while you can. If you're suffering, if you're dealing with hard times, you've got some really struggles, you need prayer. Send that in. Send it to the email. Text it. Call. Talk to someone. Send it in. And we'll get it to the elders and leaders. And we'll lay hands on it and pray for it and anoint it with oil symbolically on behalf of James that tells us to do that. Praying for one another. So don't let distance keep you from that. Don't let space keep you from walking in faith and believing that nothing can hold back the power of God, even if none of us ever physically engaged. It's all symbolic anyway. When elders or people lay their hands on you, it's not their power. It's the power of God flowing through them in obedience. So if you were here last week, maybe you remember from last week, I gave you some things to think about. The one another's. Anybody remember? One another's. How many of you listened last week and heard that part? How many of you heard that? Only one person in the building. Thank you. How about you out there? Three, four. Okay. Praise the Lord. We got a winner. One another's. I gave you some things to think about. I urged you last week. In this list that I verbally gave, I didn't physically give it to you, I verbally gave it to you, just things from Scripture. There's over a hundred one another's in Scripture. So this is part two. So last week you missed it. This is part two. You can engage this week, okay? Yep. Love one another. Live in harmony with one another. Build one another up. Admonish one another. Care for one another. Serve one another. Bear one another's burdens. Forgive one another. Be patient with one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Consider others better than yourself. Bear with one another. Comfort one another. Encourage one another. Show hospitality to one another. Pray for one another. James 5, 16, what we've just been talking about. Absolutely. As we talk about these things, what's one of the best ways that you can do all of those things? Certainly by praying for one another. But let me tell you this. When you genuinely go before the Father and you pray for someone, I'm going to suggest that the Holy Spirit would prompt you, if you're praying genuinely and in faith, He's going to prompt you to do something more than just pray. Because uh, here's why. Because James said, this is another Jamism we picked up in all this study, is that faith without works is dead. So a prayer in faith that has no action is nothing. Mm. And so men and, and people in the room here and people at home, men, if we, we tell our wives we love her for 40 years, but we don't put it in action, we got a bad case going on. We say I love you, but we don't do something with the love because love's a verb. Those of you several years ago in GLS, we got, we got a guy named Bob Goff who wrote a book, Love Does. Love does. Love does. It's not an it. It's a thing. It does. It's action. So what do we do about those that have wandered from the faith? Certainly we pray. We don't judge. We don't criticize. We pray. They're human just like us. But by the grace of God, there go I. We pray for those who've wandered from the faith. We forgive and we restore. What does restore actually mean? You put something into action to bring them back to the faith. A lot of times in our prayers of faith, 
we have an interaction maybe with someone who had wandered and there's some place where we are showing them and demonstrating a love that's accepting and encouraging. So I'm going to give you another opportunity this week to do some one another's. Praying for one another, absolutely. But again, if you pray, you have no action. Faith is useless. So what are you going to do this week? And I'm, I'm really serious about this. Church, there's, there's a lot of people still in the midst of this. Even though we've kind of started reopening, we've kind of started having church, there's still a great sense of need among people, not only in this church, but outside of this church. I, I would love to spend some time and let Angela take the microphone and talk about Friday nights and the issues that, that they're facing in trying to restore Friday night recovery meetings. There is such a desperate need out there for recovery meetings to get reinstituted because people are struggling with emotions and suicidal thoughts and all of that kind of stuff. There's such a desperate need for the church to be in action doing something. That even those who are non-believers in the secular world are begging for the church to be there. We have tremendous opportunity to put love the love of Christ into action. So yes, pray for your church family. You want a list? I'll give you a list. You can go down the list. Go Monday through Friday. Pray for them every day. You need some suggestions about what to do? I'll give you some suggestions of what to do. But I'm telling you, if you pray and ask the Holy Spirit, he probably going to put something in your heart and say, do this. So as we close out, again, those of you at home, email, text, call, get in touch with somebody. If you have a desperate need for prayer, we will put it in a place where we can do something here in our homes. Leaders can show, uh, look at it and pray for it, and we can lay hands on it symbolically, pray for it. Don't hesitate just because there's space. Don't let the space keep you isolated. Let's close in prayer. And I'm going to ask our church family here in the building to stand up. And if you will, as you stand up, would you just do me a favor, those of you who are here this morning, just kind of extend hands in faith towards needs that you know nothing about. I mean, you don't know the needs. But I'm telling you, I know Angela does. I know I do. I come in contact with people all the time who are absolutely at their end in many ways. And, again, a lot of this for us has just kind of been an inconvenient thing. It's like Happy Meal being five minutes late because we didn't get through the line quick enough. There are people who are really, really suffering. In church, we need to be a part of that solution in leaving it with the God who can, the great I am. Amen? Amen. Father, here we are. We're gathered together in your name. Your word tells us that when we gather in the name of Jesus, you are in our midst. And we know that time and space and buildings don't separate us and keep us from the power of your Holy Spirit. So we pray. There are many needs out there, some of which we know nothing about. But you know every hardship. You know every struggle. You know every lonely place. You know every hurting place, every painful place. You know those that have suffered physical loss, emotional loss financial loss, and some even loss of life and the impact on their families. God, we pray. We lift them to you. Elders and leaders of this church, we come together. We symbolically just pray and ask for your divine work in the lives of those who are crying out to you. You hear the cry of the desperate and needy. We know you desire to help us in our most difficult places with tenderness and compassion and caring that goes beyond what we can imagine or think. We offer these things to you. We're grateful for this time we've had. We thank you for the reopening of the churches and the ministry, and we just pray for wisdom beyond our years to continue to navigate these waters. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a wonderful memorial weekend. God bless you.